Hello everybody, my name is Pedro Volpiani, I'm a mechanical engineer and I did my PhD and my postdoc in compressible and reactive flows. Today we're gonna talk about oblique shocks. Don't forget to watch the previous classes to better follow this one. Oblique shock waves are present in many aerospace applications. In the case of a supersonic air intake, engineers prefer to have a combination of oblique shock waves rather than a strong normal shock in order to obtain more favorable post-shock conditions, a smaller increase in entropy, less stagnation pressure loss, etc. Unlike a normal shock, an oblique shock wave is inclined with respect to the incident upstream flow direction. It occurs when a supersonic flow encounters a corner that effectively turns the flow into itself and compresses. The flow streamlines are uniformly deflected after the shock wave. Let's consider the bidimensional problem characterized by the following states before, indices 1, and after the shock, indices 2. We seek to establish the relation between these two states. The variable beta and theta denote the shock angle and the flow deflection angle, respectively. In the shock reference frame, we have that capital V1 equals its component U1 in the N direction, plus its component V1 in the T direction. We have the same thing for the velocity capital V2. To establish the relations linking the states on either side of the discontinuity, we apply the stationary Euler equations in integral form taking into consideration the control volume shown in the figure. The vector capital N designates the unit normal vector pointing out of the control surface. The continuity equation for oblique shock reads rho1 times u1 equals rho2 times u2. Considering steady flow with no body forces, the momentum equation can be solved in normal and tangential directions. We also need the energy equation. After simplification, we obtain the following set of equations. We note that across an oblique shock, the tangential component of the velocity vector v is preserved, and the normal component of the velocity vector u verifies exactly the same conservation loss than the governing equations for a normal shock. So, the property changes in an oblique shock are governed by the normal component of the upstream Mach number. Therefore, we can treat the oblique shock as a one-dimensional shock in the normal direction. Thus, it is wise to define a normal Mach number MN1. Taking into account the geometry of the problem, we see that MN1 equals M1 sinus beta. So, to obtain the expressions for an oblique shock, we replace M1 by M1 sinus beta in the 1D equations. Thus, the changes across an oblique shock are function of the upstream Mach number M1 and the shock angle beta. The normal shock is a special case where beta equals 90 degrees. Note that to have a shock, it is necessary to have the upstream normal Mach number greater than 1, which indicates that beta is greater than the arc sinus 1 over M1. Referring to the geometry of the oblique shock, we have that the tangent of beta equals u1 over v1, and the tangent of beta minus theta equals u2 over v2. Since v1 equals v2, we have the following expression that leads to the following relation between beta and theta. The last equation relates theta, beta, and the Mach number and is very useful when studying oblique shocks. It is also possible to plot a diagram between theta, beta, and the Mach number. This diagram shows that there is a maximum corner angle, theta max, for any upstream Mach number. When theta is greater than theta max, the oblique shock wave is no longer attached to the corner and is replaced by a detached bow shock. Note that the theta, beta, and M1 relationship relates to beta angles for a given value of theta and m1. The larger angle is called the strong shock and the smaller angle the weak shock. The weak shock is almost always seen experimentally. Let's do an exercise now. Let's study two different shock structures. A normal shock 
in an oblique shock with angle beta equals 40 degrees, followed by a normal shock. The upstream condition has the following characteristics, M1 equals 4 and P1 equals 1 atmosphere. Compute the stagnation pressure ratio between the initial and the final state. We can easily compute the stagnation pressure P01 using the following formula. To compute P02 after a normal shock, we need M2 and P2, both given by the following expressions. The ratio P01 over P02 in the first case equals 7.2. Now let's do the analysis for the oblique shock. The state 2 behind the oblique shock is given by the following expression. We need to compute P2, the difference beta minus theta, in order to compute M2. We then go from state 2 to state 3 through a normal shock, using the same expressions than in the previous case. We see that the ratio between stagnation pressures P01 over P03 equals 3.2 in this case. We observe that the stagnation pressure loss is less important when we have a combination of oblique and normal shocks rather than a single normal shock alone, and this is taken into account in the design of air intakes of supersonic aircrafts. The main purpose of an inlet cone is to slow the flow from supersonic to a subsonic speed before it enters the engine. Except for scramjet engines, all air breathing jet engines need subsonic airflow to operate properly and require a diffuser to prevent supersonic airflow inside the engine. At supersonic flight speeds, a conical shock wave, sloping rearwards, forms at the apex of the cone. Air passing through the conical shock wave and subsequent reflections is low to a low supersonic speed. The air then passes through a strong normal shock wave within the diffuser passage and exits at a subsonic velocity. Higher stagnation pressures in the final state leads to a higher engine efficiency. That's it for today. I hope you enjoyed. Don't forget to visit my website for more videos and exercises. See you in the next lecture.